Okay, a slight shift in, in scale from the presentations this morning. We heard from Bruce and David what we do with big data, how we analyse it, how we represent it. From Fiona and Russell, we saw how we work with the big organisations, the local authorities, um, to find common purpose towards making the changes required to improve the city's health. As a centre's qualitative specialist, I'm used to work, working more on the micro level, exploring how people in the city navigate and make sense of their resources, opportunities and barriers to health and well-being. And I'm going to take a cut through a varied portfolio of work I've been involved in in the last seven or eight years in the centre, um, using the theme of connectedness, by which I mean social capital and networks, and how this theme has evolved to take account of some of the things we are finding in the data that meant our perception of social capital and social networks is incomplete, but also to reflect um, the re-emergence of resilience perspectives over the last couple of years. So, broad range of projects. I should also point out a broad range of partners. I've worked with people both in the centre and beyond. So if I slip into the first person singular at any point explaining all this, it's not because I've done it all alone. Um, but there's some of the, um, the health-related behaviours that I've been um, involved in looking at over the, over the years. But for, before I begin telling the story of the cut through all this data, um, I've been advised to give a little bit of a, um, a primer on some social capital related terminology. I'm sure many people in the room know this already, but it's good just to make sure we're all on at the, the same starting point. I'll mention bonding capital, by which I mean links with similar people, people with similar outlooks and values as ourselves. They're usually people we have strong ties with, they're usually family members or, or close friends. And these people are good in our lives for support. And it's been said that they're good for helping us get by day to day. Bridging capital, on the other hand, is links with people that have very different outlooks and values from us. These are usually our weak ties, they're usually our acquaintances. And these are good for helping us adapt to changing circumstances, circumstances and crises. So there's a role in resilience there for bridging capital. And it's been said, bridging capital is good for getting on. If you change career, you're more likely to find out about your new career through a weak tie, through bridging capital, than you are a family member or someone you know well. And what we knew then about social capital, we, well, we knew quite a few things, and they still, still remain true, um, but this is just to show how, how the thinking has evolved as a consequence of some of the data we've been looking at, but also some of the changing in how, change in how we think about social networks and resilience. We knew back in 2007 that bridging capital and weak ties were vital for taking advantage of new opportunities and for resilience, but we also had a sense that there was an unequal distribution of this resource in the city. And also at the time, um, Robert Putnam's book, Bowling Alone, was, was having its maximum impact. People were consider, um, concerned that the consumerist and individualist turn of Western societies in general, which was being experienced in Glasgow, <coughs> meant that people became more inward looking, more individualist, focusing more on their, their close circle and, and selves um, than, than reaching out to the community. So there was a question at the time around how, so, how social capital was done in Glasgow. Did Glasgow have a characteristic form of, of, of bonding and association that was detrimental to its health and contributed to the perpetuation of health inequalities? And this concern was summarised for me in what FMR wrote in their social capital report card a piece of work we commissioned them to do. And they said Glasgow's skill in generating bonding social capital may inhibit its ability to generate bridging capital. Tribal feelings predominate in some parts of the city and some individuals are so keen to bond with members of their tribe that they ignore, that they ignore outsiders or view them as threats. So quite a strong challenge laid down there and the wording is quite, quite strong but there was, there was certainly a sense that Glasgow did social capital differently from other places, or at least did it in a way that didn't encourage um, the inf information flows across different, um, different communities within the city. So, um, refers to that you know, uh, city of many cities idea. However, we are beginning to realise that this account of how social capital relates to, to health inequalities and resilience is incomplete. And this comes from a focus on resilience by focusing on those who book the trend those who in challenging circumstances appeal, appear to do well. And what we find when we speak to people um, about that process is how personal narratives of growth are essential to resilience. And in the case of the speaker here, this was a, um, a former problem drinker when, when we spoke to her, 
Her social network, which is so often seen as a source of support, was in the past the site of her problems. And one of the reasons it was the site of her problems was because it reinforced a view of herself that was detrimental to her health. So for her, change was required and new network influences, not just off that offered different forms of support and different forms of information, but also allowed her to draw to a close this unhelpful and destructive narrative of herself as a drink-dependent individual. Now, in her case, it was spiritual participation, it was meditating, provided, which provided a path to growth on her own terms. That won't be everybody's um, choice of, of social network or, or, or route to health, but in hers, it worked. And this highlights the point at which understandings of social networks and resilience intersect through the role social capital plays in providing authorship and meaning for our life, in providing that the stories of the forward lean so we can see past current crisis into the future beyond it. However, in some work, we have found that the services designed to help people can often be quite unhelpful in that they provide a clash of narratives between the narratives of the service and the narratives of the individual. And we found this in the uh, work we did with the Full Employment Areas Initiative back in 2006, 2007, although it was published in, in 2008. And Back then, there was a sense that there was buoyant economic times in Glasgow. Okay, although the banking crisis was just starting, um, we forget that at the time we didn't really know how it's going to play out. And certainly, 2006, 2007, there was a sense that there were a lot of vacancies in the city, a lot of employment opportunities. Yet, there were persistent areas of what the Full Employment Areas Initiative termed um, persistent unemployment. So community animators were mentors who we worked with um, to, to collect the data, and these mentors offered compensatory bridging capital to the workless. They gave them information about the kinds of jobs that are available in the new service economy, and they helped them with the softer stuff around getting jobs, the cultural capital required, how to write a job application, how to prepare for an interview, how to present yourself, that kind of thing. But what the animators were telling us when we were speaking to them was that there was a poor fit between, between the city's construction of, of the problem and the solution, and what, that, what their clients had. Basically, the clients themselves did not view themselves as long-term unemployed. So quite, a, a, quite um, an important category error there. What they were were people who underlie that terrible phrase, labour market churning. These are people who actually did have experience of, of employment. But within the new economy, the short-term contracts, the insecurity, um, the unrewarding work, and worse, the repeated experiences of being laid off eroded their faith that a, a narrative of meaning could be acquired through paid work. Consequently, other roles outside the, the paid economy offered them stronger narratives of self. And this was a reminder that making work pay needs to take account of the non-monetary value of labour, as well as um, <clears throat> including like, the meaning that people attach to it. And here's an example of a 23-year-old um, woman who shows us how she developed a sense of meaning from her role in the community rather than in the workplace. And it also illustrates how in doing this, she was actually building social capital in that community. So there's a tension here between people going to work, um, accepting meaning, meaning, well, employment they see as, as not providing meaning and narrative for themselves, and the social capital that it may actually remove from communities. And the key bit here is at the bottom, where she, where she says, I know every single one of them, they come to me. When she said that, she said it with real pride. The fact that she helps people in the community and they come to her was where she got her self, sense of self from. This is where she got her narrative of who she was and, and her forward lean. We've also collected data which reveals the idea of narratives becoming stuck so that people have a sense of, of who they are and who they want to be, but structural circumstances get in the way, and they can't develop that forward lean quite in the manner they'd like to. And we found this in our study of alcohol, and this is supported by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. And basically we found that alcohol use in young adulthood was a key way in which that age group developed their social networks, developed their social capital. And that was supported by a culture which says it's okay to drink in young adulthood, it's a, an in-between stage, um, you, and basically people found they could, they could binge drink, but it wouldn't mean that they're alcoholic, because alcoholics are older people, not people in their, their early 20s, was how they thought. It was also given considerable support environmentally, 
in that the places young people associated and met with each other also centered around alcohol. But what we were reading in, in the transcripts we were getting back again and again was people saying, I'll be moving on from this. This is just a temporary phase. And that's captured there in that quote. As you get older, you want better stories to tell than I got, than I got really hammered again last weekend. And things like long-term relationships, becoming a parent, finding meaningful work, and other full adult responsibilities, perhaps looking after parents or home ownership, were the kinds of things that allowed people to change their narrative around alcohol and become something different. However, in this quote, we found someone whose narrative had become stuck. And basically, this is a guy who is, was 25, and usually the 25-year-olds we spoke to were already beginning to establish some of those achievements, those, those markers of full adult status. But this guy was complaining to us that he was, he was kind of stuck. He hadn't found the job yet. He hadn't found what it was that would, would enable to move his, his narrative on. And he complains to us that my mates are all younger than me. So they're between 17 and 21. So when I drink, they drink. So there's this sense of him being kept back, not being able to move his narrative on. So our emerging perspective in relation to social capital and resilience is that you know, we're becoming increasingly aware of the characteristics that support resilient responses, both at the level of individuals and of community. And social capital is an important element of this. Yet so are the, the narratives that people are able to construct for themselves, which their social capital may contribute to. The question for Glasgow and the question for the centre is, how can we find spaces for these multiple stories to flourish, particularly in, the, in, in a city which has been described as, as having poor stocks of bridging capital? And finding these stories, we think, and finding how these stories work and the processes underpinning them will be important for making the Christie Report reality. Christy, you may remember, encouraged us to work closely with individuals and communities to understand their, their, their needs, maximise talents and resources, support self-reliance and build resilience. And some centre, some centre work already completed by colleagues Jennifer McLean and Valerie McNeese has already looked at small projects, not the mainstream services, the small projects which are already working in this, this narrative way. They may, but, may but be using that terminology but they are adopting recovery models where the road to crisis, sorry, the road out of crisis is not predetermined by the service provider and what the service can provider can bring. Instead, it focuses on giving participants new experiences, new achievements, and supporting them on the first steps of their new narrative of who they are. We're also beginning to take a health economics take on this with um, colleagues from Glasgow University, Emma McIntosh and, and Kenny Lawson. And not that money should trump everything, but it, it, we can make the arguments for these approaches more persuasive in the current climate if we can show, actually, it makes economic sense to do this as well. And finally, a challenge to us as researchers. How do we represent meaning and narrative as data? And already in phase three, there's ongoing work that touches upon this stuff. Recently, we've been funded as part of a consortium by the Arts and Humanities Research Council to explore community narratives, narratives that that are available in communities about that community, but also to engage with policymakers around what those communities are aspiring for themselves. Um, you may have seen, most of you would have seen the films that Bruce has just shown, so you can see we're already making progress and using different media and capture, capturing narratives in different ways. And finally, the new story for Glasgow, which is a, a theme that's cutting across projects in the centre. And this is encouraging us to understand how the story we tell of the city might help with our resilience. This doesn't mean shying away from the city's problems, but having stories that provide a compass for, for, for the way forward, perhaps when problems arise that we haven't predicted. Because the Young Foundation and their reports on resilient communities rowing against the tide described a resilient community as one that has the collective belief in their ability to adapt and thrive <coughs> in spite of adversity. So the stories we tell of the city are the first step towards having a more resilient city. Thanks. <laughs>